Hello and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, together with my favorite co-host, Bethany Ruff. Welcome back to the show. Hello, hello. It's been a minute. It has. I'm excited. I'm so stoked when you get to be on to these shows with us, and we have an amazing guest uh, to introduce to you now. Richard Rossiter is a returning guest on our show. We recorded with him back in episode eight, so be sure to go check that out. It was a great conversation. Richard is best known for creating Rossiter Stretching, a two-person tissue release system designed to offer quick and effective pain relief for many diverse issues. He has used the system successfully on countless clients and has trained many other practitioners, including Bethany. He is the author of the book, Step Out of Pain the Rossiter Way, which he wrote in 2006. In 2011, he was officially inducted into the Massage Therapy Hall of Fame. He is the recipient of the Purple Heart for his excellent service in the Vietnam War. We are so grateful for his work and wisdom and are honored to welcome back to Boundless Body Radio. Richard Rossiter, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have you, and I would encourage the listener to do exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to sit back and enjoy this amazing conversation between you two, and I know I'll have a lot to learn, so this will be a lot of fun. Go for it. So before we started recording, we sent you a couple questions, some topics that we wanted to address today, and your response, I loved it. True to form, you said, I like talking about pain. So let's just dive in wherever you'd like to start. How does our body get into pain? How do you deal with it? Just anywhere you want to begin as far as the course of pain goes. I think that one of the biggest things that uh, people don't understand about pain. And, and when, I, when I'm talking about pain now, <clears throat> I talk about structural pain. I don't talk about disease pain such as uh, cancer or uh, MS or you know, any, any of those other uh, types of pain. I, I think of myself as strictly a person who deals in structural issues. So that means uh, low back pain, uh, shoulder pain, uh, uh, TMJ, uh, things, things of that nature. You know, uh, if you've got knee pain, you know, somehow you've probably, you've probably dinged yourself up somewhere down the line or you've, you've done a, uh, something that has to do uh, repetitively, you know, whether you're a runner or you're standing at a machine all day, or you're looking at your computer, a lot of those pains come, those are the types of pains that I'm talking about, the ones that are the everyday issues. And those issues uh, can dominate, end up dominating our life if we don't know how to get rid of them. And in today's world, you know, the, they wanna do shots pills or, or surgery to these types of pain, which only makes them worse. Uh, and I don't mean in the, in, in the short term, I mean in the long term, you know, when you start doing these things to your body, uh, your body wasn't designed to have uh, surgery as such. Uh, the, if, if it was designed to have surgery in and all those little places that I mentioned, whether it's your wrist, your elbow, or your shoulder, I figure that we'd have had zips put in, and we don't have zippers on our body anywhere, which means that we create scar tissue. And when we create scar tissue, we enhance the pain in that area, and we do it by further injuring the area that we're, uh, well, we would be working on in the Rossiter system. So it becomes, uh, uh, it behooves us to know what causes the pain and, and why it sticks around for so long. Yeah, please expand so on like that. So you'd like me to continue? <laughs> yes, yes, please do. I'm just, I was going to ask okay. when someone comes into you for a Rossiter session and maybe it's their first one and they have you know, really nagging pain, for example, in their low back on one side. And that's obviously where their brain's attention is going to is, oh, it's got to be like coming from this low back. Where do you, where do you jump in? How do you start with someone in that case? Well, you have to understand, uh, there's some principles that you have to have to uh, understand out there. And one of them is uh, big muscle, little muscle. And uh, I've, 
I've stood by this uh, from the very beginning. It, it took me a while to figure out, but big muscle, little muscle is just simply this. Who wins? When the opposing, the antagonist muscles in your body, again, you know, these are the muscles that work against each other. Uh, when I say that, I'm talking about like bicep, tricep, or your quads versus your hamstrings, that kind of thing. What you're looking at is who will always win? And the answer is the big muscle will always win. It was designed that way. We were designed to have that big muscle, little muscle uh, dichotomy there. And so that means you have to work not on the area of pain. Say if you're, if you're, having, if you're having low back pain, as an example, uh, the, the muscles in your back, those little, uh, those little uh, quadratus muscles in the, in the back, uh, uh, basically, those are the small muscles. And they are working against muscles that are in the quads. If you look at the quads, uh, that is pulling down on your hips. So you, the top end of the quads are on your hips. And when they pull forward, and are overpowering the back muscles, you are losing balance. And when you lose balance, that's when it starts to be painful. And when you do it on a, uh, as a, um, a way to, to, let's say you're, you've been standing around, you know, you look at somebody when they're a teenager and you, do, and you see this person way far away, but you can tell by the way they stand that it's so-and-so. That's the way they always stand. And you can't quite bank out who they are, but that's who, you know, you can see that they stand, you know, and usually it's on one side or the other. And so what happens with that person is they develop a larger muscle on one side of their body. We tend to think front and back. And what we sh should really be thinking of is more side to side. And so when we have that quad that's been built up from standing on that one side all the time, what happens is we'll start to develop in the other side on the opposite side. So in other words, if I stand on my right leg all the time, I'm going to have pain in my low left back because my quad on the right side has overpowered that muscle in the back. And so you have to know which ones belong to which uh, antagonists so that you can relieve the pain. So when I stretch out, when I stretch out the connective tissue of that leg, I am reinserting balance into that whole system. Now, I use the terminology of the uh, anatomists when I talk about connective tissue, I don't say the connective tissue, I say the muscle surrounding uh, the area. And the connective tissue is the casing in which the muscle sits. And so that casing and all its subtle, le uh, uh, subtle levels of encasement that means uh, you're talking about uh, each muscle fibril being encased and then muscle uh, tissues and then bigger muscle tissues. And then you get all the way out to the outer, outer muscle tissue. And when you do that, when you do that and you stretch the connective tissue, keep in mind, muscles basically bitch because it's too tight. That means they're not getting nutrients. And when they are not getting nutrients, including oxygen, they were designed to bitch. And so that bitching is what you are hearing when you have pain in your body. And what you have to do is you have to open up that tissue back to its original design. That's huge. You have to have the muscle at its original design point and that means anywhere in your life that there, there exists that perfect balance between muscles. Now, how do we keep that uh, muscle uh, 
from becoming uh, bitchy. Uh, we have to give it that space that it needs. Typically, if you look back, way back in time, what did we do? Well, we walked everywhere. We were designed to walk. That is the one thing that is uh, true, I mean, is beyond our capability to think, we were designed to walk. And when we do not walk enough, our body tells us by bitching. How and about so, if walking yeah. is painful? And see that, and that's, and what happens uh, if the walking is painful, that means that you're out of balance for your design. Now we were designed to walk and we were designed to stand and we were designed to sit and we were designed to lay down. Basically, we were designed to sit on a rock or a log. We sit in lazy, uh, lazy, uh, lazy boys nowadays. And, and uh, we lay on couches uh, the same way all the time to watch TV because if we, if we were to lay the opposite way, we'd be laying looking at the couch back. And so we, we, ha we pick up these habits Okay, and, and when I say habit, uh, I'm always thinking in terms of it's bad because we're not thinking about it. It's just bad because we do it and we don't do it uh, without not thinking. So we have these ways of doing things. As an example, I always brush my teeth with my right hand. That's a habit. If I tried brushing my teeth with my left hand, I would beat my mouth up. So uh, habits that we want to have all our life and, and as we grow older, we need to be able to keep certain habits. And one of those habits is to walk. And when I say walk, I'm talking about walking at a, a good pace, not sauntering, not kind of window watching while we're cruising through the mall or something like that, but doing actual walking. And if you, and for a lot of people, when they start walking again, because they haven't walked in a long time, the first thing I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to bring you out and show you how to do is how to walk in grass. And when you learn how to walk in grass and you take that grass walk, back onto a sidewalk, you will not get back pain if you keep the grass walk. You walk differently in grass. We were designed to walk in grass and sedge and on uh, trails. We were not designed to walk on the immense amount of flat that we have out there. We invented flat. Nature didn't come with flat. Can I ask you a quick question about what we're walking in as far as our footwear? Our footwear, very good. Uh, the, the, the thongs that we, we put with our toes in between and, uh, you know, uh, so that they are, they're curling the toes down. It's probably one of the worst things that you could do to your feet. Now, if you're gonna have a shoe or a sandal, you need to have something on the back. If you can walk barefoot, hallelujah, you're, you're doing it right. But most all of us now have gotten used to shoes, which means that we, we pump up the back part of our leg uh, by about a half an inch over the front. And of course, unless you are in high heels or something like that, that women wear. Uh, but that little bit of change can make a whole lot of difference in our lives. So if we are already accustomed to uh, having a shoe on with, with uh, you know, an extra half inch or maybe three quarters of an inch, something like that, then that's what we, that we have literally re redesigned the body to uh, accompany uh, a shoe, to have a shoe on. And so that is our design now. Uh, we have to uh, accommodate that and make sure that that is a part of how uh, how we wa walk. And you know, and and your shoes, you know, your shoes can determine how you 
how fast you walk. If you don't feel comfortable in your shoes, you're not going to walk at a good clip. And when I say a good clip, I'm not trying to outrun anybody. I'm, uh, I look at people that are walking together and I, I sometimes I cringe because uh, a, little, uh, a little person walking with a tall person, you have different gates and you shouldn't necessarily be walking together or one of you should be able to go ahead and then stop, stand, wait for the short one to catch up. Uh, those kinds of things happen. So I always tell people, pick someone your own size and go for a walk. So think about that. So coming back to the, the method that you created, I want to talk about the difference in the active versus passive role of the person that's coming in for pain relief. I very often hear from my clients, well, I've been getting massage every week or I've been getting monthly chiropractic adjustments, but Rossiter's just so different. They're actively it involved. It's very, it's much more deep and powerful. Can you touch on that a little bit? Absolutely. It's uh, Rossiter is different in that you are actively you are making the person who is getting the Rossiter uh, workout, you're making them do the work. When you are going to change your body, and you're going to, and when I say change your body, you have to change your body in order to get rid of the pain. You can't just take a pill and hide it. You can't take a, uh, a surgical uh, cut in it and change it. You have to change it from within. So. When a Rossiter practitioner applies the weight to any area of the body, you automatically have to engage the person who is getting this workout, who is doing the workout. You are assisting them in their workout. You are making them move to the, you might say, the extremes of their body. When I say the extremes of their body, people have a a regular routine, but when they stretch, okay, and this is called Rossiter system. I wanna make sure we got that. This is not Rossiter stretching. This is Rossiter system. And it's the rossitermasters.com that you go to for the Rossiter system. There are copycats out there and the copycats don't do it justice. So I just wanna say that ahead of time. Now, but what you're looking for in that person is that for that person to reach as hard as they can within the confines of the amount of uh, pain that they can handle from allowing a Rossiter coach to apply weight. Now, there is a reasonable amount of, and you know, people worry about the idea of pain. Pain is, is what you, it's what you make of it. And there is good pain and bad pain. And when you're doing a Rossiter uh, movement, you are stretching that tissue to its fullest while you are in that position. And so when you make a person move and you make them do all the locks that they do in Rossiter, and that's where they stretch the rest of their body, in the opposite direction, say that they are their arm. So that under the, under the weight of the foot, what is happening is, is the tissue is stretching in both directions. And so what you, and that's exactly what you want. And not only do you want it, I say in both directions, but as much as possible in all directions. So that what you are doing is you are reclaiming the connective tissue length that it was designed to have again. So just for our listener who maybe has not gotten a roster session done or roster workout, excuse me, done on their own body. If you can picture like a, a scuba suit or some type of stretchy fabric, like you're pulling at an all end. So it's elongating and you're getting the most, the most stretch, the most length through that tissue as possible. So, so next question I have for you, uh, kind of along the same lines, is what about abdominal tissue? We notice our hip flexors, our knees, all all of our joints, shoulders, neck, back. Why do we not think that 
tension adhered tissue in our abdomen around our rib cage diaphragm is, is not creating an issue? It's not creating the issue. It's a part <clears throat> of what has been done in the rest of the body that is the issue. So if you if you stretch out our if you stretch our limbs, you know, if we're if you're in, in Rossiter, we we concentrate on the limbs. Uh, when you open up the limbs, you are opening up the central part of the body. Now, that's a part of why I always tell people after Rossiter is go for a walk, because what you are doing is you are integrating the session that you've just had in Rossiter. So your your coach you will will tell you. In fact, I I've got this I've got this fun uh, coach in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, where uh, she takes their keys away from them so they can't go straight out to their car. How smart! And and so and so what she does and, and people walk in and they'll see someone walking by at a good clip, and they'll say, "Oh, you're on your Rossiter walk." And they'll go, yeah, yeah, I got to get my keys back. And so, <laughs> and so what they'll do, so what they'll do is she makes them go uh, twice around the gym uh, before she'll give them their keys. And that way she always gets amazing results. All of her people don't just, because if you think about it, if you just go back into the same pattern that you just got out of, OK, so you're getting back into your car, you're sitting in a bucket seat, everything is collapsed uh, you, and your shoulders are rounded in, your knees are up. And so what you're doing is you're reinforcing the pattern of the car. And that's the last thing that you want to do is reinforce that pattern. And so that's why she does that. And I, you know, and I've told her and commended her on that because because she gets such amazing results because she doesn't allow them to just literally just go from the go from the floor out to the car and and reinforce you know maybe a half an hour's worth of driving so so that they they reinforce that old ugly pattern that's in their body and so when a a person gets home from work, you know, they've been sitting at the desk all day. And what do they do then? They go and sit in their car for another half an hour or whatever it is. And then from that, they get they get home. And what do they do? They go home and they sit on the couch. Well, every time you're doing that, you're collapsing your structure and in a way that is not helpful, healthy or helpful for a a a body to be, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like your dog, you know, your dog always wants to go for a walk. Okay. That's what they were designed to do. They were designed to get out there and move and, and jump and, and play around in that. I mean, they don't want to sit on their butts all day long and not get their walk. They've got to get their walk in. And so I keep telling people, get your walk in, get your walk in. I, you know, I usually do five to 10,000 steps a day. Uh, that's my, you know, that's my goal every day is to be able to get that in. And the more I can do it on a trail or, uh, not on a sidewalk somewhere, uh, the better off my body is. And I, you know, and I'm, uh, I think differently when I'm on a trail than when I, when I am in a mall, I, I, I move differently. Uh, everything about it is designed to give you all of the, the, the odds and ends of, of, of walking that you, that you should have. But unfortunately, most of us don't have that. I mean, I gotta, I gotta tell you a, a quick story here. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't, I was staying with, I was getting uh, my advanced rolfing in and I had already caught on about walking and I knew <clears throat> how a walk should sound and I didn't I couldn't do it myself because I've got a I've got a screwed up foot but I was staying in this place and around the corner I couldn't I couldn't see the person and I heard his footsteps landing and I knew what a perfect sound a foot should make when it lands uh, if you're walking correctly and so I heard this around the corner 
And this guy came around the corner and I looked up at him and without saying anything else, I said, where were you raised? And he looked at me, he gave me this weird look at because I'd never met him before. I was in his house. I was sitting in his li living room, looking at his books. And I turned around and I said, where were you raised? And he looked at me really strange. And he said, in China. And he was an old, old dude, about 80 or 90 at the time. And immediately I knew that he had, he was in, uh, I mean, he was basically around rice paddies. He was on, on trails. He was on wooden planks that, that maybe crossed a, 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 a small stream. He never walked on a flat concrete or a flat surface. And it turned out that his parents were um, Methodist uh, uh, missionaries. And so he was, as a young boy, he grew up and he spent his first 20 years in China. And so his walk was probably what is now missing in China because they have so many cities, but in the, in the country, when you walk, you, in a, in a short, short way of saying this is that when you, when you walk, and you are walking in the bushes, you might say, you lead with your knee, okay? You lead with your knees, and then you flip your foot out, and then it collapses onto the ground. And so how we walk is we walk leading with our foot. We lead with our toes. And so, it's the wrong way to walk, basically, and that's why we give ourselves back pain by walking on flat surfaces without the knowledge of knowing that you need to lead with your knee, not your foot. So let's say someone has a structural difference on one foot versus the other, where maybe one, there's a leg length discrepancy. The issue could be up at the hip, for example, and one foot over pronates, the other one over supinates, or there's a different ankle position. Is walking going to further exacerbate the problem happening at the hip, or will that eventually unwind itself? Well, the perfect scenario would be to unwind themselves. Okay. But as for myself, since I am in that position, I'm 71 and I will never get back what happened to me when I was two, okay? So you have to walk as normal as you can, as you see done. That may mean that you trade some things in. Now, when I say you trade them in, if I walk the way I feel, then I'm going to have sciatica because one leg isn't the same size as the other. So what I do is I walk like I have, you might say, like I have two left legs. That's my good leg. That's my dominant leg. And I always, I always try to honor that because I cannot, I have, I have, um, flop foot and and I cannot lift my feet my right foot the way I lift my left foot and so I have to adjust myself but what I always try to adjust myself to is what is the most normal I can make it so it might not be like if someone was watching you to completely balanced on both sides but you're trying to match the one that is stronger Exactly. I had, I had, I had a girlfriend once that had the exact same flop foot as I did. And when we walked down the street together, we would, you would hear, you would not hear one foot and then you'd hear the other one go. Oh, that's funny. You guys would be good at a three-legged race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so so it was uh, so i <clears throat> so you have to you have to keep your walk as normal as you can in your hips so that you, it's like you make a trade at the end of the day if i am 
uh, when I'm tired, I will trip over my right foot occasionally because I'm not thinking to lift it the way it was designed to be lifted. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, so, so sometimes, uh, you know, I'll be talking with someone, walking with them or something, and I will, I'll just trip over that one side, you know, uh, you know and, and, you know, it, it looks like I've, I've, I'm drunk or something, but I'm not. I just trip over that side every once in a while. And it, and it, it happens nearly every day. So, uh, and this has been going on my whole life. So I, I just know that I have to try to keep it as normal as I can on both sides. And that will, that will help me in my hips and in my knees. And so if I, if I allow myself to walk as I was redesigned when I was two, uh, I know that my knee will give me problems. I also know that my hip will give me problems on that side. And so I have to keep what I consider you know, it's my internal measuring device, you might say, but it is something that that I know that I have to do or I will get in trouble with that. So that leads me to a question. I actually had a conversation with uh, Chantel Tatioli a while back and we were trading some Rossiter back and forth and she brought up a good point that really made me think and in my brain, everything needs to match. It needs to be as even as possible. The sensation I feel inside, I want my right arm swinging as much as my left. And she kind of stepped back and was like, well, how even are we supposed to be? Because, you know, the average human, I imagine when they were hunting, was going to be stronger on their right arm or could carry more load on their left arm. You know what I'm saying? So how how yeah. balanced, what, what are we striving for? How do we know we've gotten there or that we're all out of whack? Well, yeah, that's the thing is, is, you know, <laughs> the thing that happens is, is life happens. And because life happens, we all get out of balance. It's the walking that try that we try to do enough of that keeps us in balance. It's when we, we stop walking, we start sitting around too much. We start, um, uh, at, well, as an example, a small example: When you when you use a, a mouse on a on a computer, your arm your right arm gets tired. But when you try doing it with your left side, you 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 can't do it, or I can't anyway. So so we again we go back to balancing things out and and stretching things. Uh, my personal stretch that I use every day is I I have I have to do pull ups every day because I dislocated my shoulders so uh, so badly when I was young that they will fall out if I don't keep strength in them. And so every day I, I find a bar somewhere and I do 10 pull-ups and I'm good. And my, my arms operate normally. If I don't do that, that little balancing act, what will happen after three or four days is my shoulders will start to dislocate in the middle of the night. And let's, let me tell you, nothing wakes you up quicker and keeps you awake faster than dislocating a shoulder while you're sleeping. <laughs> Ouch. So yeah, yeah. On, on that note of sleeping positions, do you have any recommendations about a specific, you know, firm or soft mattress, pillows, sleeping position? I feel like I'm constantly asking people to link their pain to noticing what time of the day it's the worst. And a lot of people mention that first thing in the morning, they're in their worst pain. Yeah. And part of it is, is you have to look at how how they're sleeping. If they sleep in a fetal position, that's bad. Uh, I don't, I never recommend a fetal position. I, I recommend, uh, I mean, I can, personally, I cannot sleep on my stomach or my back. I sleep on my side. And uh, typically I sleep on my right side and then midway through the night or something, I'll, I'll roll over and, and get on my left side. Uh, but I'll always, I'll always start out on my right side. And part of that has to do with my shoulders. And part of that has to do uh, with uh, my hips. 
And what I always recommend for people to be able to do, and there, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do to stretch out your hips. But if you, if you tuck your hips uh, in, like uh, in a partial fetal position, what you're doing is you're setting up your day to be in trouble uh, in your low back and hips because what you've done is you've shortened your connective tissue in your hip joint that you are shortening by having it for eight hours uh, tucked up close. And so as soon as you get out of bed, the first thing that you're doing is you're, you're attempting to stretch the connective tissue back out again to the way it was designed. And if you do that too much and you sit too much, then you are, you're, you're looking for trouble. You're absolutely going to be in trouble with your hips. And that's why there are so many hip replacements because people will do this. They'll go to the doctor and they will, they will complain about their hips hurting. And the doctor will say, well, there's, uh, you know, here's something that we can do. And uh, usually they will give a shot a cortisone shot in the hip. And that starts the spiral down to hip replacement because as soon as you apply a shot, you, you give that injection in the hip, what you are doing to that area is you are doing what's, what's commonly called necrotizing the tissue, which means you are killing the tissue in that area. Okay, and when you kill the tissue in that area, all the tissue around it bitches louder. Now it's sitting next to dead tissue. And if you think about bone, bone does not get that much blood. Okay, and if you inject next to a bone, uh, cortisone, cortisone will, will sap the strength out of a bone simply by killing the tissue that it is involved with in that area. It's like, uh, so whenever you get a shot of any kind, and that includes COVID, uh, you need to rub the area, rub the area good uh, for a half an hour, rub the area, get the shot material that is highly concentrated in that area, out of the area and into your body so that the whole body can absorb the shock. When you put cortisone into a hip, typically speaking, you've got to give it a, you've got to give it a, a xylocaine or a lanocaine kind of shot first to numb the area so that you can put the needle in for the shot that is now a, uh, uh, a, with a very viscous uh, liquid, uh, which is the cortisone. And it's, it, it changes the whole area. It changes how you will use your back. It changes how you will use your leg. All of that changes once you have put in the shot. You don't know it because it's small, it's subtle, and that subtlety becomes bigger after it's all been done. So, you, so it might be, it might be a, a year later before the the pain may start up again, but this time it's worse. And the reason it's worse is because you have, you have basically damaged the tissue in the area that you have put the shot. And if you really want to get a handle on this, if you ever ask a person if they have received a cortisone shot, ask them where and have them point to it. When you have them point to it, what, you, what will happen is when you put your hand on that spot where they had the shot and then put it on the opposite side of the body. So if you had it one, one shot in the area and one, none on the other side, what you do is you touch both sides at equally at the same time. And what you will find in the tissue is there's a divot. And it's, a, it's like a little hole where the, where the shot went in, but that's actually where you atrophied the tissue in the area. And that atrophy is now 
it, that is now the new cause of the pain. It's not the original cause. It's now the new cause because you have changed the tissue in the area. It's no longer uh, the healthy tissue it was that was just bitching before. Now it's damaged tissue. This, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> I knew I was going to learn a lot from the two of you, and I've been learning quite a bit from both of you about the cortisone thing. And I just, I can't, I, I can't believe how crazy this all is. And like everybody gets cortisone shots. It, it's so ubiquitous. Yes. And they don't even think about it. They don't question it. They don't learn any of this stuff. I didn't know any of this stuff. Nobody talks about it. Your doctor's not going to no. tell you either. It's so crazy. No. I just think for the listener, like you really need to think about these things and ask certain questions because this will uh, impact you for the rest of your life. Oh, abso absolutely. You know, cortisone shots used to be, uh, they used to be thousands of dollars. Well, now they've gotten them down to about 300 bucks. So nobody th thinks anything, you know, they don't think anything of it because now it's not a cost issue. Wow. It's, it's just, I want to be comfortable issue. And by them becoming uh, comfortable, what they have done long term is they have shortened their ability to be comfortable. I, I remember I was sitting near some doctors once in a cafeteria, and one doctor said, You know, if it weren't for high school football, I wouldn't have a practice. Well, think about Think That's about sad. how many times you've talked to people. And I, you know, I'm of the age where back in the day, <laughs> and I'm talking 50s and the 60s, and mostly I'm, I'm talking 60s, but people would have two, three, four, five, six operations on their knee. You know, that was after the that was after the cortisone shot. Well, the, after the cortisone shot, it's too late for everything. Now, I mean, now you're at a point where, well, I need a, I need a replacement. Well, now, of course, you get these people that get the replacements and then now the glue doesn't hold. Okay. So now you've got, you've got a, a knee where, you know, I, like my father, you know, his knee end quote slips out once in a while because the glue didn't stick. Well, what's the, what's the, uh, the, uh, Solution for that? Well, you open it all back up, and you put more glue in there, wow. <laughs> which is, which is, again, absolutely nuts. Because now you're talking about about opening up a person again. Now you're talking about scar tissue. You, you know, you're talking about all the things that you need to avoid in order to not be old and crippled. You know, I. You know, I go out and I walk, you know, I walk the trails two and three miles. And, you know, it's really, it's really interesting because, you know, you see, I see people my own age now that, you know, it would be a joke for them to even do a pull up or to walk a mile. And everything is, everything is about comfort and it, and it can't, it can't possibly be. You've got, you've got to be able to to work your tissue at least on a, a semi-regular basis. And what happens is when people even do that, what, what they will end up doing is they will, they will cause some pain and they will think, oh, well, I better stop. And it's not about stopping. It's about blending your body and blending your, your workouts into a lifestyle that you can handle doing all of the things that you want to do, which may include, uh, God forbid, walking your dog. Your dog needs it, you need it, but you've got to be able to make it work with what you are doing. And that doesn't mean sitting in front of a 90 inch TV screen all evening watching uh, what we can probably all agree on is a certain amount of trash. I, yeah, I love that. Those are all very great points. And I feel like they're so simple, but not easy always for people to incorporate in their lives. They're thinking about the, you know, 12 week workout plan that has to fit in with their already busy work schedule. Something else I noticed, I just want to make sure we have time to talk about a little bit is breathing issues. Uh, something that is fundamental should be completely unconscious to people but respiratory. So can we talk a little bit about how the respiratory system works, maybe like the lungs and diaphragm? And I'd like to touch on uh, respiratory release as well. 
the respiratory release is consistent with being able to do regular stretches. Everybody should have to take a deep breath once in a while, you know, and I, I mean, get that baby in there, you know, and, and, and just do that once in a while. Most of us don't unless we're athletes, okay? But even athletes don't fully utilize their breathing capabilities, okay? And so with Rossiter, uh, what I discovered uh, was how you, make, how you make more area for you to breathe. And you're thinking about, you know, when you look at uh, the area that you breathe, you're looking at, you know, above the diaphragm. So you want to be able to release the diaphragm, but that just means taking a huge deep breath. And that means using your stomach all the way to your nostrils, all the way up. Okay. Every, you use everything, you know, it, uh, they teach breathing, you know, the diaphragmatic breathing. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm all for being able to learn and to do these kinds of things, but getting yourself winded is a good thing. You know, I mean, I'm not talking about grandma, you know, I'm, you know, unless she's been doing it her whole life. But I'm talking about your younger people that are, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s, you know, whatever on up, uh, as long as you're doing it on a consistent basis. You need to be able to do that. You need to be able to stretch your chest or stretch all the connective tissue that surrounds. And this is... You have squamous uh, cells called squamous cells in your lungs. You have all of these uh, alveoli and, and that. And all of that needs to be able to have some sort of stretching mechanism. And the easiest stretching mechanism for that is probably to go running or, or somehow make yourself take deep breaths that you have to take to get yourself back, you might say, you know, if you, if you didn't take the deep breaths, you'd pass out from lack of oxygen. But in Rossiter, we have techniques or a technique, I should say, that opens up the lungs via utilizing your whole body. So there's something in Rossiter called locks. And these locks that you, you stretch out the connective tissue uh, with uh, either your, your arms going above your head or your feet really stretching out. And when I say your feet stretching out, I don't mean your toes pointing down. I mean your heels pointing down. Uh, when I say that, I'm talking about if you're on your back and you're to stretch out your, your legs, you don't stretch them out with your toes. They're already stretched. They're overstretched. If they're, if they're anything, they're overstretched. You need to be able to reach hard with your heels, reaching hard with your heels. The backside of our lower part of our body, because we sit, is shorter than the front side. The front side is longer. In our upper body, our front side is shorter and our backside is longer. And so we've got this dichotomy of both ends uh, being on opposite sides. And that's where doing something like having a bar on your bedroom door. You know, they make these bars now for your bedroom door and so that you can hang from a bar on your bedroom door so that you don't have to necessarily go anywhere, but you can stretch out your arms. And when you stretch out your arms, you stretch out your lungs. That's huge. You stretch out your, your abdomen. You stretch out all, the, all that in... Um, those inner workings in your abdomen and your diaphragm, all of that gets stretched out by hanging. And so I combine hanging with my pull-ups. So I will usually do uh, my, my 10 pull-ups and then uh, I will hang there for uh, a few moments afterwards and then I'll walk. And so all of that nice new tissue that I have stretched out what I do is by walking, I integrate it into the rest of my body. So 
there's a lot to be said about being able to integrate the the uh, the tissue in the breathing with the rest of your body, and so and so when uh, when we do uh, the Rossiter, what's called Rossiter respiratory rescue, because that's usually when you yeah, that's why you need it when you need it is because you can't breathe. And, and so people are, are, you know, they, they're asthmatic and what are they doing? They're, they're using a, uh, uh, one of those spritzers with, with the chemicals in it to get their, uh, to open up the lungs. Well, if you do that long enough, you're, you're not going to get the same effect that it would have on you if you just used it once or twice a year or something like that. Now you're talking about a chemical that's in your lungs and people use it it on a daily basis sooner or later it's going to it has to lose its effectiveness the lungs basically say yeah yeah it's you again but i can't do it because you're a chemical and i'm not i am not designed to be inhaling chemicals all the time it's like smokers you know they they wonder why they have no breath when they're 50 or 60 you know it's the same principle uh that i think it's albutamol and they, you know, they love having giving albutamin out to people. Uh, eventually, it will lose its effectiveness. It doesn't right at the very moment, but over time, it will lose its effectiveness. And then they start going on to all these other crazy drugs that they use on that stuff. So bad path to go down. So th yeah. this is roster respiratory rescue is kind of a different one where the coach is using their hands instead of their feet. Um, yeah. Something that really struck me when I was learning it, I thought it was so awesome. The metronome. So there's kind of like a, a specific beat that the practitioner is using to uh, help create the release. Can you talk about why the metronome? Yeah. you. The body, <clears throat> if you just were to gently push on the body, and just just do nothing but just push on the body, say at the hip or something like that. You'll notice that there's a wave that goes through the body, okay. And and if you if you push too fast, you get you get this jiggle that it's just it's it's not uh, it's not soothing and it's irritating. And so what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to incorporate a relaxed body into the whole method with the locking. And so there is a there is a certain rhythm that the body picks up. And it's that rhythm that you are trying to work with that will stretch the body to its maximum. Because what you're trying to do basically is stretch the lung tissue all the way from the toes to the fingertips over the top of the head. What you're trying to utilize is the space of the entire body, the, the, the connective tissue from all of that. And you take all of that tissue that is, the connect, that is connecting, it's always going through the lungs. Remember, all this connective tissue, that's what it does. It connects everything to everything, which means that your feet are connected to your lungs as much as your fingertips are. And so what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to rock the body at that, at that metronome uh, level that I was shown in class. And <clears throat> by doing that, what you're doing is rather than just trying to stretch the connective tissue around the lung alveoli is you're trying to stretch all of it all, the entire connective tissue system, you're trying to change the whole system by nanometers everywhere, okay? So you're talking about tiny, 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 tiny changes that if you just did it without the rocking, it would have an immediate effect that would be short-term and it would, and, and would not last like it does when you incorporate the whole body. You're always trying to incorporate the whole body when you make these, when you, uh, when you stretch the tissue. Because that way, you are not just stretching tissue around the lungs, you are stretching the tissue around the lungs from 
all the way from your ankles and your feet and, and, and from your hands over your head. You are doing all, you are, you're taking the entire connective tissue system to help mend the problem in the lungs, the asthma, the COPD. Uh, even I, you know, I believe that it would probably help with COVID if, if, if I were given the chance to work with COVID patients, I'm sure that I could make a difference, but they won't let me near a hospital. <laughs> mm. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I have to say, getting it done, you wouldn't think that the inability for your lungs and rib cage to expand and your diaphragm to shift up or down would make a huge difference in how your back and hips and knees and your whole system felt. But it is incredible. The biggest change I could feel is, oh my gosh, my lung is supposed to expand into my rib cage and my back and my side, where I see now so many bodies that are just shoulder breathing or chest breathing. Everything is up and down, not in and out. So there's that lack of elastic recoil. Exactly. They're not, they're not using the full lung. You know, one of the people I worked on was a chiropractor and he says, you know, I can, I can feel my lungs all the way into my back now. And he said, I can feel it. I can feel it in my, in my shoulders now. And, and yeah, our lungs are that big and, and we should be able to utilize them. Now, if, you know, if we were young and crazy and we ran like hell when we were, we were young kids and things like that, then we probably have a very good start, but we have to be able to keep that. And it, as you get older, as people collapse, they don't collapse back, they collapse forward. And the first thing that's going to be affected by that is the lungs and heart. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. This has just been an amazing conversation. I think I'm going to walk away from this with a greater reinforcement of what we've done, which is on, on kind of equal parts amazing as humans, what we've created for ourselves and, and the comforts that we have, but also this reliance on comforts for every little period of discomfort. Like it's too cold outside, so I'm going to heat up my house. It's hot and sunny, so I'm not going to get sunshine or go be outside. I don't like to sit with my emotions, so I'm not going to meditate. And it's just, I think it's so important to create resiliency by being uncomfortable every now and again. And I just, the two of you and everything that you've brought to the table and educated me and the listener has just been outstanding. It's so great. Richard Roster, if you had one simple tip that you'd want the listener to take away from our chat today, what would that be? <laughs> well, the biggest thing I'm ever going to say is walk. <laughs> you got to walk and, and, and do it in grass. And, and, and when you do it in grass, go back out onto the sidewalk and try to keep your grass walk on the sidewalk. If you can do that, if you can do that, wonderful. And if you can, if you are able to still take steps two at a time. Mm. Well, that's awesome. I think I'm going to go out and practice that right now. <laughs> Richard, can you, um, can you let our listeners one more time know where to find you and find your work and connect with you? Uh, my, I'm going to be, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm creating a completely digital class where they are going to be able to have me on, on, a, on webinars. And uh, right now, our, our website is rostermasters.com. And that's where you, that's the only place you're going to see me on the web. Uh, I have, I have, I am currently setting up a way for people to be able to, uh, I, I've, I've taken the full Rossiter system course uh, from, from four, from four in-house uh, classes that were, I, I travel around to 26 modules. I'm putting them all in modules of, of a couple hours each so that people can, can do this from home. They can do, they can literally go all the way to certification from home and they can do it for probably, uh, maybe a fourth the cost of what, of what it would have cost them to go somewhere and learn from me. And uh, we're going to put part of that in webinars. It's I have already I have already made all the all the uh, uh, PDFs. They they are going to be in keynotes. They're in 
in uh, uh, PowerPoints. And uh, not only that, they are also going to be, uh, I have included in, in, the, uh, in the keynotes, the, uh, the ability to become an instructor. So uh, all my instructor notes are in there so that uh, people can, can go straight to that. They can look at only videos uh, uh, and all the videos are under a minute because all they're doing is they're showing the techniques, just the pure, simple technique that I designed. And if they, if they just follow that, they will become in, in, incredible uh, roster coaches and instructors. Wow. That's amazing. What a cool resource. Um, especially in this day and age that, that people can look up and, um, you know, continue learning from you, Richard Roster. We're so grateful for you and all of your work and for coming on to help us understand some of this stuff better. We think it's so important. I'm, I feel so fortunate that I get to learn from you and I get to learn from Bethany every single day about how effective this stuff is. And so thank, thank you both. I, really just, I, I'm so glad I get to see so many people get healed and step out of pain. So again, thank you so much. And thank you for coming on to our show. Thank you so much. You bet. Okay. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.